Open your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 21, and we will we'll start. Let's go ahead and pray first. Father, I, I pray that you will uh, move in our minds, our hearts, Lord, if we are if we're tired, if we're weary from whatever went on last night or, or, or for any reason, I pray that you wipe the cobs, cobwebs out of our mind and help us to pay attention um, to your word today. Lord, I pray that you will speak in a way that um, we're able to apply um, to our lives. I pray that you will use me as your vehicle, Lord, and that I will say only what is in accordance with your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so our gospel lesson kind of just drops us into the middle of a conversation that, or I'm sorry, probably a fight, I guess you could call it, between Jesus and the elders and the chief priests that's happening in the temple. And to, you know, I don't like to just come in the middle of someone's conversation without getting a, and making some conclusions out of that. I'd like to back up and understand the context for what we're uh, given today. And um, I think if we do that, it will make a lot more sense. Now, if you go back up to the beginning of chapter 21 in your Bible, you will see that that is what's called the triumphal entry. That's when Jesus, is the, toward the, it was the beginning of the last week of his life, he uh, rode the donkey into Jerusalem, uh, crowds called Hosanna, they waved their palm branches, he was hailed as king by the people. Um, He goes directly um, through the city gates of Jerusalem. And where's the first place he goes? Where where does he go first? Who knows? The temple. He heads straight into the temple, and he doesn't like what he sees. He sees money changers who are uh, taking regular money, and they're, they're exchanging it for temple money, that people can use to buy sacrificial animals to give to the priests. And the money changers are taken a little bit off the top, and that's going to, uh, that's going to the priests. So Jesus sees that. He gets angry. He gets mad. He starts overturning their tables, and he causes a, a, a bit of a ruckus. Um, now, we know that when he did that, certain people wouldn't have been happy, Right? The, the, the chief priests, namely, and the elders, that's a, a word for the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling council of the Jews, they would have been upset because they're the ones who gave these money lenders, these money changers, permission to be there. So who's this guy from Galilee coming in and messing up what we have allowed to exist? They would, they would be very upset at Jesus. So... Um, anyway, that takes place. Jesus then leaves the city. He goes. He spends the night um, in the, or on the Mount of Olives. He comes back the next morning. He curses a fig tree. You can see that there. And as soon as he curses the fig tree, it withers and dies. That's not like a magic trick. If you're wondering if he's just showing off his powers, that's not what that is. The fig tree represents Israel. And so when Jesus cursed it, why did Jesus curse it? It wasn't bearing fruit, right? And so he said, all right, well, you're not going to bear any fruit anymore. That's a picture for us of what's going on as he comes into Jerusalem. These people are not receiving them. They're not bearing fruit and keeping with repentance. And so they also will wither and die. That's his point. After that, he goes back into the temple and we're told that he starts teaching again. Now, here's another problem. To teach in the temple required that you get a license, a teaching, preaching license from the Sanhedrin, the elders, And that you would be approved by, kind of an ordination process, by the the priest, the the chief priest in particular. If you didn't have that, you had no authority to preach or teach in the temple. You couldn't be called a rabbi either. You couldn't go out and teach in other synagogues. You had to have this license in order to be an accepted teacher in Israel. So that would have probably uh, teed some people off looking at that. Uh, and seeing Jesus walking around teaching. Now, we also know something in, something about the way Jesus taught. I, how many have ever listened to an Orthodox rabbi teach? Anyone? No one. Okay, well, if you do, this is what you're going to notice. Everything they say, they're going to footnote. They're going to say, all right, well, this is the way you live, and the reason I say that is because Rabbi so-and-so 
um, said that. They're going to always footnote or base or ground what they said and what other rabbis before them have said because that lends them a certain amount of authority. So they footnote those who have come uh, before them. Now, interesting, when you read Jesus' teaching, what don't you see? He doesn't footnote anybody. He says, hey, um, I know it was said this in the past, but I'm telling you, I know your rabbis told you one thing, I'm telling you that you need to be kind, you need to forgive your enemies, you do good to those who persecute you. And then if someone asked him for a footnote, what did he say? Well, my father in heaven, my God. And how, if you're a professor in college, how would you like that if you went to the back of your uh, term paper and you see God in the bibliography? That wouldn't, it wouldn't go over so well. That's kind of what was going on here. He was claiming an authority that superseded those who held authority in the temple. Jesus walks in and he acts and he talks and he does things that communicate that he owns the place. Which does not make the elders and chief priests happy and so they confront him. And you can see that in the section right before our parable. Um, They give him this question, who gave you the authority to do what you're doing? Because we sure didn't. Now, Jesus always does this. He answers the question with a question. And the question is this. Was John the Baptist's ministry from God or from man? Now, that question put these guys in a really tight spot. Because the elders and the chief priests were the only ones, out of all of Israel, out of all Judea, anyway, in Jerusalem, who refused to go to the Jordan and be baptized by John. We'll talk about why they refused that later, but you just need to know for now that they refused that. On the other hand, most other people believed that John was a prophet from God, that he spoke uh, as a herald from God, preparing the way for the coming of the Savior. And at this point, John has already been executed by Herod. So not only do most people consider him a prophet, they also consider him a martyr, a holy martyr for Yahweh. Right? Now, think about the timing, too. This is Holy Week for them. I know we have our own Holy Week. This is Holy Week for them. It's the Passover. There's lots of pilgrims there. There's lots of crowds there. They're, they're, they're already passionate and zealous for God. So the the chief priests and the elders know, we don't want to say anything to to get these guys angry, right? So they have a problem. On the one hand, um, if they say, oh, well, John's ministry was from God, then Jesus gets to say, oh, really? Then why did you reject him? I thought you were teachers of Israel. But if they say, no, he wasn't from God, they're going to have a problem with the crowds, as we're told there um, in, in Matthew. So they get their holy huddle together. They kind of team up. What are we going to say? How are we going to fix this? Uh, How are we going to answer? And they come up with the only answer they could really ever come up with, which is, I don't know. Um, We don't know. We have no idea. And so that's when Jesus launches into the story. And what you need to know is this, all the story is predicated or or proceeds upon this foundation of a question about John the Baptist's ministry, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Keep that in mind. Okay. So Jesus starts out there in verse 28, and he asks this question, what do you think? It's a good thing for us, right? Because we have to think this morning. So if you're, if you're sleepy or tired, um, I'm going to ask you to think. Jesus is going to ask you to think. A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And the son answered, I will not. But afterwards... He changed his mind and went. How many were here last Sunday? Okay, the the setting of this parable, the vineyard, should ring some bells. What was the vineyard representative of last Sunday? Who remembers? The kingdom of God, right? The vineyard in last week's parable was the place where God's will in heaven is done on earth. 
It's the place where God, God's people um, dwell. So we know um, and live. Um, so we know that this parable is not just about agrarian principles in the first century. It's about the kingdom, kingdom of God. The elders and the chief priests also know this because they've read Isaiah and they've read Jeremiah and they've read Ezekiel. And in all of those prophets, God uses the vineyard as a symbol of Israel, as the people of God, as the kingdom of God on earth. It's used in that way. So they know. Their ears are perking up. Perking up. They're not just thinking, oh, why are we talking about fields and vineyards? They're, they know that Jesus is about to tell a story about the kingdom of God, about eternal things, not just temporal things. All right. That helps us understand also the father's call to the first son. He says, come work in my vineyard. It's an invitation into the kingdom of God. To call into the kingdom. Now, last week, the vineyard owner went out to find workers that were not related to him. If you remember, he just went out and found some, some guys hanging out, being lazy. He said, hey, Kay, come on into my uh, vineyard and work. And so they did. In this case, we don't have uh, that. We have instead an already existing familial relationship between the father and these two sons. There's a relationship there, but, and this is so important for understanding this whole parable, but... Notice that both sons start off outside the vineyard. They're not in the kingdom of God. They're not simply born into it by heritage, right? Huge point that wouldn't have gotten past the elders and the chief priests. None of the sons inherited the vineyard by right. So the father goes to the first sons and says, go into the vineyard. And notice also the father speaks in the imperative. It's a command. Now, when first century, or excuse me, 21st century American parents tell their children to put down their PlayStation controller or the television clicker and go clean the room um, and or do some work, uh, no is unfortunately not an uncommon answer. We, we are used to that. That doesn't shock us when it happens, right? That's not how first century Jewish families rolled. They didn't play that game. Anyone um, know what God told Israel to do with snotty, rebellious teenagers? Anyone? Stone them. Yeah, I'll, I'll read it to you. It, it, it's, I'm, uh, it's kind of shocking. If a man has a stubborn, rebellious son, doesn't say anything about daughters, I guess they get a pass here. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, all the many of men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. Some crazy stuff in that book. So we all know that God put obeying mama and daddy up there in the top ten, right? The commandments, we know that's there. Um, because the way you relate to your parents' authority reveals your heart toward authority in general and God's authority in particular. Uh, you treat your earthly parents, um, who you can see like dirt, and all likelihood you'll probably treat your heavenly father who you cannot see. Like dirt. So parents are supposed to instill discipline in their kids, and kids are supposed to obey um, their parents. And also, because that rule had been in place for uh, several thousand years already, um, since Sinai at least, it was the norm for Jewish teenagers to obey daddy, right? Dad says, go work in the vineyard. You're saying, yes, sir, and you're, you're out there. Right? It, it, it is not culturally normal for a son to say no to a father. That's what makes this first son's answer so shocking to first century ears. How dare he? And we've got, in order to get this parable and get where Jesus is going, we've got to feel that indignation. 
The only, the only thing I can think of that maybe gets me close to it was last, or on the top of my head anyway, was last Sunday after church. We were um, in my living room and we had the blinds open. I was looking across um, the street and there was this, this woman who was about 60 or 70 years old and she was pushing uh, her mower across her lawn and it was pretty grown up because it had been raining a lot and she hadn't had a chance to mow before then. So it was really thick grass. Now, on, on the porch, on the porch, drinking beer were four, I would say men, but boys who were probably in their late teens, early 20s, watching her, watching her. I, I saw that. I just, I, w- I wanted to go over there and strangle them and just take them down. I felt such anger at that. And I was so mad. Anne told me not to, so I didn't. It, said it wouldn't be a, it would be, a, it would be a good witness to them. So I didn't. Um, but I, I mean, maybe that's, I just felt some indignation at that. And maybe you have similar memories in your past where you can remember seeing something and someone just holding in contempt or treating contemptuously someone who should be treated with honor and respect. And that evokes in us a sense of revulsion and anger. It just does, right? Chief priests and elders would have felt that way about this first son who said no to the father. And, and this is important, they would also have felt that kind of outrage and indignation toward tax collectors and prostitutes. Who, though sons and daughters of Abraham by birth, show open contempt for God sometimes even in his holy city. These guys walking the streets, seeing prostitutes, would have just would have been curling their blood. How can they do that in this city that God gave us? Now that attitude towards sin that they have, they had, may seem foreign to us, but I'm going to suggest to you that it's not all bad. I mean, the bad thing about the way the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did it is it was always directed externally um, toward other people. But the, the revulsion toward sin is, is not at all bad. The first step, the very first step in committing your life to Christ is acknowledging that in thought and everything you've thought, in your words and in your deeds... You have not done as you ought to do. And you have done as you ought not to do. Very first step is recognizing that. No one likes to hear that, but I don't know many people who can truly deny that or say, no, I've done everything I'm supposed to do and I've never done anything I'm not supposed to do. We all, I think, are able to acknowledge that we are in certain times, in certain places, wrongdoers. The difficult part for us, I think, is not seeing that we're sinners, but recognizing the infinite depth of the offense that sin is before God. We are not outraged by sin. As God is. It's hard for us to comprehend that even those sins we consider minor reveal contempt toward God who must always be glorified and honored. And even those minor sins set us in a terrible and a dangerous place before him. We have learned, I think, in our culture, especially, and when I say we, I do, in fact, mean we. I mean me too. We have learned to excuse ourselves for everything. There are very few consequences in our society. Many parents decide not to discipline children when they need to be disciplined. Many schools no longer give 
this is, I'm not saying all these things are bad. I'm just giving you a list of the ways this works out culturally. Many schools decide not to give grades that accurately reflect where someone is academically because, hey, you know what? We want them to go on to the next level. We don't want to hurt their feelings. We, don't, we want them to feel good about themselves. And so they just pass, pass through. We have sports leagues without scores, um, some, some of them, right? So you'd never lose. You can, you can play badly. You can play horribly. You can never practice and show up and, uh, and lose the game terribly if you were keeping score, but you're not, so it's okay. You can make bad life decision after bad life decision after bad life decision. And you know what? In America, there's usually a safety net. I'm not saying it's all bad. Some of those safety nets are good and we need them. But what has that taught us is my question. What has that taught us? You have to work very hard to totally fail in life here compared to, say, Molly, where Anne grew up, where you decide to sit out the harvest or the planting season, you know, just to have a little me time, right? And then, then the next, you're starving, basically, at that point. There's no, there's no safety net. You do that in other places. It just doesn't work like that. We shield ourselves from consequences in so many ways. And again, not all bad. We shield ourselves from consequences in so many ways, and that itself has a consequence. So someone says, you've sinned against God. We, I'm using the cultural we here, we shrug. Yeah, so what? We are not outraged when we offend God. In fact, we're outraged that God would dare be offended. The suggestion that there are eternal consequences for what we do makes many people angry. Just to hear that. Now, Jesus and the Pharisees did not agree on much. But they agreed that the worst possible thing is for anyone to die in their sins. They saw that. They knew about consequences. Jesus said, whoever believes in the Son, and not just a cognitive belief, but whoever trusts in the Son, commits his life to the Son, has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. That's not Paul, the mean Paul. That's Jesus talking there. So for first century Jews, sin against God sparks outrage. And, um, and so the first son's no in our parable taps into that outrage, taps into that indignation. And everyone listening is waiting for the son to get it. Right? He said no to the father. All right, he's going to get whacked. Come on, Jesus, finish the story the way it should be finished. That's where they are. But something happens. Jesus says the first son changes his mind. The word for that is meta uh, melathis. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly because no one really speaks Koine Greek anymore, but I think that's right. But what it means is, or it has the same root as the Greek word metanoia, which is turn around or repent. Something happened to this guy outside the vineyard. He changed his mind and he goes back and he enters the vineyard. Fire has not come down from heaven. The guy's still living. Right, so if I'm, if I'm a first century Pharisee, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of dissatisfied now. That's not, that's not the ending I was waiting for. It's not good. Now the father approaches the second son. And he asks or he commands the same thing. And the second son is the good son. The second son says, I go, sir. The Greek there is curious. I go, Lord. The second son knows the law. 
He knows he better respect his father. So he says exactly what he knows he must say in order to be safe. But then we're told he did not go. As contemptuous as the first son's words were, this is worse. Not only has he not done what the father said to do, but his decision not to go to the vineyard reveals that even his yes was a lie. So he doesn't get any credit for the yes, sir. It was a lie to the father. Double the sin here. And this is, just by way of explanation for a moment, this is how God sees the good works. Good works. Not bad works. This is how God sees the good works, the externally good works of an unsurrendered heart. Let me say that again because I've got a little phone ringing there. This is how God sees the good works of an unsurrendered heart. Outwardly, they are yes. Yes, I'll help in the soup kitchen. Yes, I'll help with the garden gala. Yes, I'll help with the harvest. Yes, I'll go feed the poor. Yes, I'll go um, preach the gospel. Yes, I'll go to Bible study. Yes, I'll go to church. Yes, 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 yes. But inwardly, they are no. Think of the Pharisees here. Yes, yes, we'll do all the sacrifices. Yes, we'll tithe our mint and our cumin and our dill. Yes, we'll do everything you say to do, Father. That's where we are. Saying the right words, serving in the right ministries, expressing the right compassion for the right people mean nothing if your heart is hard toward God and Jesus Christ. Nothing. They get you nowhere. God sees straight through you. Straight through you. He knows whether or not you love him by the way you respond to and follow his son into the vineyard or not. He's not fooled by the things you do. So Jesus asks this question, which of the two did the will of the Father? Probably the um, elders and the chief priests are happy because finally they know the answer to a question. They can say, yes, I know this one. And they do. They say, well, the one who did his Father's will. And they're correct. They're right. And Jesus closes the trap. Tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you For John came to you in the way of righteousness. We're talking about John the Baptist here. He came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw it, you were not willing afterward to change your mind and believe him. So unpack this. What did John the Baptist do? The answer to that question is contained in the question, so you can tell me. What did John the Baptist do? Baptize, right, exactly. Now, John did not invent baptism. Did you know that? He wasn't the first guy to come along and start baptizing people. Jews baptized before, rabbis baptized before. Baptism um, had been going on a while, and what it was for uh, most of the time before John came on the scene um, was was this? It was it symbolized repentance. It symbolized the washing away of uncleanness and sin. All things we're familiar with with baptism. It also symbolized entry into Israel, initiation into the kingdom of God. Baptism was for unbelievers. For dirty, nasty Gentiles who are coming into the people of God. 
But John's baptism was for Israel. That's what was so offensive. He was saying to everybody, and the call was to everybody in Israel, you are all outside the vineyard. You all think you're in the vineyard. You're not. Every single one of you need to come to the Jordan and be baptized. Every single one of you. Now, um, that was offensive. It's as if someone stood at this pulpit and said, you all think you're followers of Jesus. You're liars. You think you're in the kingdom. You're all not. I know each one of you is not in the kingdom. That's what John the Baptist was saying. Don't sit there and listen to this and say, not me. Yes, you. You're all outside the kingdom. It's as if you've never followed Jesus before. You all need to get rebaptized because you're all dirty, nasty, rotten sinners. That's John the Baptist to Israel. Can you see how that would have sounded and how that would have set a lot of people off? I hope. How would you react? Jesus says to his, to his uh, friends here that that message was in the way of righteousness. In other words, John spoke from God. John was herald's, God's herald. Now, there were Jews in John the Baptist's day living in open contempt for God. We talked about this a minute ago. Adulterers, prostitutes, extortionists, known as tax collectors, liars, cheaters, thieves, murderers, people who looked at God in the face and said, no, I don't want you. I'm not going to do what you say. But one thing about these people is that they did not pretend They were obedient children. Nor did they fool themselves into thinking there were no consequences for their disobedience. They had been told over and over and over by the religious authorities in their day, you are doomed. You're done. Cash it in. You have sinned so greatly, there is no hope for you. So when they heard John, they heard, hey, you are very far gone from the kingdom of God. But the gates of the vineyard are still open. They have not closed. You can turn now, John said. You can go through the gate. You can start over again. You can be baptized. You can surrender to the coming Lamb of God who will take away all your sins and wipe them clean. No more condemnation. No more doom. No more despair. You can free yourself from all of that if you just turn and come. Now, some of you may know this morning that you are very far gone from God. You may have lived a life of open contempt and defiance toward Him, saying no in everything you do. The gate to the vineyard is open. You are not condemned yet. Jesus, the Lamb of God, has come. He is here this morning. Turn. Turn. Repent. Go back to your Father's vineyard. He loves you and He will accept you. Repent and go to Him. Now, today. Excuse me. 
John's ministry did not sound like hope to the priests and the elders. It was an offense. How dare you? We are the teachers of Israel. We are the models of faithfulness. They assumed that their yes to the Father in the form of good deeds and obedience to the external requirements of the law, their performance of daily and weekly religious rituals over and over and over again was going to be sufficient. That's what they believed. Meanwhile, they rejected God's own messenger, John, who said to them, You praise me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Even the good things you do are lies because you will not submit your heart to me. There are in every congregation... People who go to church, but who have never entered the vineyard. People who believe that good thoughts, good works, good words, the years of attendance, baptism, communion, all good things that God requires, who think that all of these things are going to save them. But in truth, these are the outward yeses of the second son. If you hope in you, if you hope in anything that you do, If you hope in these things and your performance of these things, I'm going to be very honest with you. You are lost. You are lost. Because in trusting in what you <clears throat> can do and who you are, you are also forsaking the one who God sent, the Lamb of God, to take away your sins and perform the works that you cannot perform. And you're saying no to the Father. Repent. Repent. I'm speaking to Episcopalians now and Anglicans and those of us who've been raised in the church. Repent. Do not harden your heart. The reason God hates the outward yes The reason God hates the outward no. The reason God hates disobedience is because he loves you infinitely. And sin is your destroyer. Repent and turn to him and live. One final thing and we'll close. If you are in the vineyard. Notice that the vineyard is the place where those people who are called do the work God has given us to do. You see that? Go work in the vineyard. The vineyard is also a place where those who say yes to God go. That yes saying cannot end in the vineyard. You cannot look back to the one-time conversion experience you had when you were nine and say, all right, I'm good. No. You, a, a, a good tree bears good fruit. So your life now in the vineyard is to be one of not just saying yes, but doing yes. Wherever you hear the voice of God convicting you of sin, telling you you need to do something other than you're doing now, a person in the vineyard responds with repentance and then obedience, saying yes to God. That is the fruit of repentance that God seeks. 
Now, we're done. This has been a tough, tough sermon. Um, If you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, if you want to commit your life to him, if you need to repent of a life lived apart from him but in the church, I do invite you after the sermon to go into the back and people will be there to pray for you. If you need to repent of just the way you've been living life in the vineyard, also I invite you to go back and uh, be prayed for and with. Let's close in prayer. Lord be with you. Father, I thank you for um, the vineyard. I thank you that you've made a place where we can come and be safe. Lord, I, um, you are the only one who can soften a hard heart. Father, I pray this morning that by your Holy Spirit, you take hearts that are hard and you break them down. Lord, draw those who are far off to yourself. Awaken our consciences so we can see where we are proud in need of repentance. Draw us to your vineyard. And for those of us who are here, give us the grace that we need to be obedient sons and daughters. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.